All right, everyone, let's uh, get started. Welcome back uh, to uh, 6826. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, specifications and uh, abstractions. Um, so uh, something is a little bit wrong with my uh, setup here. So let me reset my cursor. All right, let's try this. So um, we're going to talk about uh, specifications and abstractions. And uh, for today's lecture, we assigned you guys to look at the COC implementation of the specifications and abstraction infrastructure that we're going to use for the lab assignments. So we don't really have a reading question like we normally would, so we don't have a breakout group to go with that. Uh, but I wanted to get you guys uh, sort of active a little bit and asking questions so that you can ask questions during the rest of the lecture. So I was hoping to uh, pick on a couple of you guys and uh, just ask how your uh, introduction to COC has been through the software foundation exercises that you guys have been doing. Uh, so I'll just pick a couple of you guys. So maybe uh, Alex Root, uh, can you say a few words about uh, how you found the COC homework so far? Does it make sense or? Um, yeah, so I feel like I, I've had, you know, a decent experience with the homeworks. Um, I personally thought the reading was way more advanced than the homeworks. So I kind of have been, I, I kind of struggled with the readings a bit. Um, but the homeworks seem pretty straightforward and I, I haven't had any trouble with the, any of them so far. Makes sense, yeah. So there's definitely a big leap from the homeworks, which are like the basics of how to use COC to the infrastructure we're uh, trying to cover in the lab assignments. So part of uh, today's uh, lecture or most of it is actually gonna be to explain what the heck is going on in all that COC encoding. We're not gonna spend a whole lot of time looking at the COC uh, source code that was assigned, but we'll, cover the logical thing that uh, all that cock machinery is trying to realize. And then uh, if you have time at the end, we'll scroll through that cock source code and see how the various symbols that are going on in that uh, cock module correspond to the diagrams and the lecture that we'll sort of cover uh, now. Uh, so I was gonna ask also uh, Caleb, uh, how are things going in, in, in Software Foundations? It's been going all right as well. Yeah, similar to AJ, the homeworks weren't too bad. I had some installation issues, but it's been okay. Uh -huh. And But the readings, yeah, I was kind of lost in the notation. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. So I think uh, hopefully we'll clarify a little bit of that today. And also I think we'll try to make sure, or I think you'll uh, gain much more experience with them by actually working through the lab assignment that we're nominally, I think, handing out today. Uh, that uh, you guys can look at them there as well. Uh, Amanda, uh, I guess you raised your hand. Yeah, I just thought I, I would want to offer my perspective too. I think that uh, the basics homework on uh, that was due or that was assigned on Tuesday, due on Thursday, um, was really helpful for me. But still, in looking at the other mini homework assignments, I think it's been a little bit tricky just to understand the cock language in general. It's kind of like if you were to show someone how to write a for loop in Python and you show them the Python code for it, and then you ask them to write a for loop on their own without looking at anything, and then also to write a while loop, right? That you should, you think that they'll understand the logic of how you iterate until, you know, a certain condition is met, um, but it's really hard with the syntax. So I think that memorizing the syntax is gonna be definitely the, the tricky part for me, but I think I understand the overall ideas that come with it. Makes sense, yeah, it's definitely a bit of a, you know, deep dive <laughs> in many dimensions, right? Like first off, it's not quite a programming language. It's almost a math language. And then it's a functional programming language, if at all. And that's different. And then there's this dependency type system and theorems and the stactic language for proofs. There's a lot definitely going on here. Uh, so I think our hope is much of what you'll do is pattern matching. So you'll sort of copy pieces that you've seen before. So hopefully you don't have to invent things from scratch uh, almost ever. Uh, you'll hopefully can look at prior examples of things that have happened or were done um, in material that we've handed out. Um, but definitely uh, office hours, I think, are a useful way to try to get more understanding or post on Piazza. We're more than happy. I think COC in particular lends itself well to asking questions on Piazza because there's often like one little thing that you're stuck on, what symbol to use or what tactic to type in, 
And if you just copy paste what you're stuck on, uh, it's very easy for us to offer help on Piazza, by email, by uh, office hours, so whatever works for you guys. I think we're happy to try to get you guys up to speed here. And also I think um, you don't have to learn all of cock in some sense. Uh, so the lab assignments uh, leverage uh, some, some stuff out of it, but you don't have to know everything. That's why we're only covering a couple of chapters from software foundations. And uh, don't worry too much if not everything makes full sense. Uh, it might be easier for you to figure out what's really needed uh, once you start working on the lab assignment. All right, so hopefully the thanks for actually feedback. Uh, I think that's sort of as expected. You know, talk is a bit of a weird thing to experience first time, uh, but hopefully we can help you guys through this. Um, and uh, please continue to ask questions throughout the lecture. This will be hopefully make it much more interesting as well. Um, so to recap where we are, um, our goal is to uh, worry and uh, figure out how to deal with specifications and abstractions. And the goal overall of this approach of writing specs and writing abstractions at all is for us to have some way to reason about the possible executions of some piece of code. So we might have a system that we worry about being correct. So we need to write down a spec that captures what that correctness means. And then we need to potentially have a proof, which we'll look at in this whole class, uh, for whether the code actually meets the specification. And what you guys saw last week uh, is sort of Butler's view uh, of uh, what this, uh, oops, my mouse keeps shifting. Um, so what you guys saw last week is uh, Butler's take on uh, what this uh, specification looks like. And uh, Butler has a very principled way of looking at this uh, in a way that captures all possible situations. Um, so it's a general view, if you will, of what is a spec and what is abstraction. And you'll uh, see sort of the general view of abstraction from Butler next week. Um, and the beauty of this uh, way of looking at the world is that it actually covers pretty much every situation you might worry about. Um, so it deals with concurrency, it deals with uh, potentially crashes in your execution, it deals with distributed system issues, as we will see. And uh, this is uh, quite a powerful uh, thing to have is that you know that worst case, uh, you will always be able to think of the world as Butler uh, proposes and uh, make sense of it. But for today's lecture, we're going to look at a much more specialized and maybe easier to realize version of the story that's really specialized for sequential programs. And what I mean by sequential programs is uh, single threaded code that runs on one computer. We're not worrying about crashes or multiple servers or threads or any of that. And as a result, it might, uh, this is going to be the basis of the infrastructure we're going to use for labs, even though in labs we do eventually worry about crashes and a limited form of concurrency. But this will hopefully also give you a much more operational view of what do you do? How does all the specification abstraction business uh, work out in practice? Any questions about sort of the context for this? Sorry, can you can you repeat? It's a specialized sequential programs are like single threads that run on. Yeah, so by sequential programs, I mean sort of just single thread of code. There's no concurrency, no multiple processes running around, uh, no multiple computers, no network, no worrying about crashes so far. Okay. Partly where these two approaches come from is that um, the specialized view that I'll describe in this lecture really came out more from the programming languages community which uh, was worrying about uh, just like single threaded uh, pieces of code, how to formally reason about them to start with. And the general view that Butler espouses really comes from the systems community that fundamentally worries about all these issues of concurrency, crashes, distributed systems, failures, and all that. And uh, the sort of state machine view of the world is a sort of a complete description of how you could model and reason about the correctness of the entire system without having to simplify it to necessarily single threaded. So let's start out uh, and uh, first talk about uh, how we're going to, uh, let's see, I need to cook up a new slide here. Um, 
Um, so first off, we're going to start off by talking how we're going to reason about the correctness of code at all. And this is done using a system called uh, Hoare logic, named after uh, Tony Hoare. Um, so Hoare logic is a particular way of writing down specifications or thinking about what is a specification even of some uh, piece of code that we're talking about. And the world view from the point of view of Hoare logic is that there's sort of two things going on. There's some state of the system at the bottom. So we'll draw it over here. And we might start out in some state S0 over here. And in addition to state, there's code that you might want to run. So over here, we'll have some code, which might be a function f that you run on your computer. And what a function does, or what any piece of code does in Hoare logic, uh, in their sort of view of the world is that it takes you from one piece of state to a new piece of state. So your computer is now in a different state having run function f and you also get a return value from the function. So the function returns something. And that's sort of the worldview you should have for uh, whole logic is that this just keeps happening. You might then run another function uh, to produce another state, this function g you know, might in principle be even a function of the return value that you got from the previous guy. It also produces its own return value, R2. And this just keeps happening. So that's how Hoare logic thinks of what is interesting in a computer system, what we have to reason about. Um, and in the world of Hoare logic, what a spec looks like is really um, a description of how the function transforms one state into a different state and its return value. And these specifications in Hoare logic are written in terms of what we call predicates. So predicates are really just a sort of mathematical statements about what is true in some state. So uh, we'll look at examples uh, shortly, uh, but it, it just kind of describes uh, what must be true in state S0 here uh, for one instance. Um, so in uh, Hoare logic, part of the specification is what we call a precondition. So this is something that must be true before the function runs. So this guy relates to the starting state S0 over here. And, uh, for some reason, my mouse cursor keeps disappearing. Um, and then there's also another predicate called the post condition. And the post condition must hold on the resulting state after the function f runs. And the post condition also takes into account the return value. So this combination of the precondition plus the post condition here is a specification for function f. So that's how Hoare logic thinks of what a spec is. And one nice thing about this kind of a specification is that it's very sort of clear what it means, if you will. It is a direct description of what will happen if you run function f. And the only restriction is that before you run function f, your state has to be kind of nice looking, meaning that it has to satisfy this precondition over here. But as long as you satisfy the precondition, like the ground rules for what you have to make sure before you call function f, then this whole logic spec tells you that, well, you'll get some state out that's going to satisfy this post condition. And this post condition describes not only the state, but also the return value of the function that you'll get by running it. Hopefully that makes some sense. That's, that's the kind of a, that's what, that's what, that's what we're going to mean by a specification in this world of for logic. Any questions about this? Does it also specify how it handles errors if it does not get? Ah, so this is an interesting thing. Uh, so there's um, um, this is a sort of a simplified picture in some ways. So there's uh, two kinds of errors you might worry about. One kind of an error is that the function returns some kind of an error code. If so, that's just part of the return value, R1 over here. So R1 might be not just some uh, value like the value you get by reading a disk but also the error code. So it might be a tuple saying, well, here's the error value or success. And here's the actual block that you got from reading the disk if it succeeded. So all the outcomes of the function, if it returns in some form, are, have to be captured by this return value R1 over here. Now there's another kind of failure, which is what happens if the computer never returns. And poor logic actually is a, a kind of a 
partial specification, uh, which is a technical term in PL, which uh, means that it only describes what must be true if the function returns. If the function never returns, the world view of core logic is that it doesn't matter. It never returns, so nothing else can go wrong. And you'll never have to worry about what happens later because it's not happening. The function is not returning. And if it doesn't ever return, then you know something is true about R1. So that's one sort of interpretation of what core logic has to say about functions that never return or fail in the middle in some kind of a failure mode where no further execution happens. Hopefully that makes some sense. Yeah, that does, thanks. Super, yeah. So it might be uh, sort of instructive to try to compare this uh, view of the world with uh, the state machine view that uh, Butler was proposing uh, for how to describe a specification about describing all the transitions of a state machine. Um, so one interesting thing here is that in the state machine view of the world, there's actually no calls and no return values. So unlike in for logic, uh, Butler's worldview was that there are no function calls necessarily return values at the top level of what you think about. It's all just state transitions. And as Butler explained in his lecture, what's going on is that at the system level, these calls are really fake in a way, not fake in the sense that they don't exist, but really that they're a higher level notion that's not present if you look at the lowest level of what a CPU does. There is no notion of a function call as an x86 instruction. It's really a convention. So really the way to think of it is that uh, function calls in uh, a state machine view of the world are really somehow present inside of the system state. So you can understand the calls by looking at the state. And similarly, the return values of what a operation returns are really in the state. And in particular, they're even in this externally visible part of the state that you have to preserve when proving some correctness of, of an implementation against a spec. That's one sort of syntactic almost, not quite syntactic, but a relatively uh, less important difference between the whole logic view of the world and state machines. And perhaps a bigger difference is really that in this uh, state machine view of the world, um, all the intermediate states matter. And in the whole logic view I presented, actually intermediate states don't matter. So state machine view of the world really considers all the intermediate states that you step through. So in the state machine view of the world, just to sort of by contrast, you would worry about all these little green circles that you step through, and you would want to say something about all those green intermediate states that you step through. But for whole logics purposes, it actually doesn't matter what the green circles are. And the reasons for this are really that whole logic ignores concurrency. So the intermediate states matter for concurrency, because if you might execute multiple threads, another thread might observe one of these green circles. But if there are no other threads, no one can see the green circles, so they don't matter. Another reason why you might observe one of these green circles is crashes. So if your system is running along and crashes and reboots halfway through, then you might observe this green circle because that's as far as you got. But again, in our model of core logic, the world is very simple. There are no crashes that we worry about. And as a result, these green circles never become relevant. So those are sort of the big uh, comparison points, if you will, between the simple whole logic we're going to look at and the general purpose state machine view of specifications. Hopefully that makes sense. Any questions about that? All right. So let's talk about uh, now, uh, apologies for the most cursor problems. Um, let's talk about an example of what it means to prove uh, specifications in the whole logic style for a very simple toy example here, um, which we're going to call StatDB. This is actually going to be the uh, assignment for lab one that you will have to prove in Coq and the framework for uh, our lab assignments. So what's going here is we have a simple database of numbers that we're keeping track of. The code is shown on the slide. You can add a number, which just adds it to the total in the count. And then you can ask for the average that you've seen so far. And it's a, hopefully a pretty straightforward piece of code here. You're just tracking all the numbers, adding them up. 
at any point, you can ask for what's the average of all the numbers that have been called passed into add. So hopefully the code doesn't look too mysterious unless I made some grave mistake in typing up this pseudocode. Um, but it's interesting to look at what the specification might look like um, for this example, if you consider, if you sort of write it in this, uh, or think of it in this for logic style. So let's look at this uh, spec for these two pieces of code. Um, so uh, to remind you, the spec for for logic really takes the uh, form of two predicates. One is a precondition for what is needed to call a particular piece of code. Another is a post condition that describes what must be true after the piece of code is done. So the precondition uh, in general is really a function of the state S in which you're invoking the piece of code. So for calling add, there's no restriction. You can always call add. So we'll say that the precondition is just true. And the way to think of it is that uh, the caller's job is to make the precondition true. And if it's already true, there's nothing more to do. It's already true. And in other cases, we'll look at examples where the precondition might not be trivially true. And then it's up to the caller to make sure that it is actually true before making the invocation. All right, so the precondition is easy enough. What's the post condition? So the post condition is gonna be a function of the new state S prime and the return value. So here, add is not gonna return anything, but the state S prime is actually kind of interesting. Um, so here, we probably need to say that the state S prime, um, there's sort of two things in the state. There's the total and the count. So probably we should say that the total for S prime is what the total used to be plus the value X that we passed in. And the count in the new state is equal to the old count we used to have plus one. So that's what it means to write a spec in a for logic style for something um, like the add function that we're looking at here. Make sense? Any questions about this formulation? I guess maybe this question is more so just understanding the difference between spec and code, but it seems like the spec is doing the exact same thing. Yeah, so here the spec is pretty close to the code. There's not a whole lot of interesting stuff going on. Um, you could imagine potentially some interesting piece of code going on here that could be captured uh, by a shorter description of what happens to the state. Um, so one nice thing is that the spec just needs to say something that's true about the resulting state and not necessarily of how to compute it, even though in our particular case, it ends up being very operational looking already. And uh, with abstraction relations that we'll talk about later in this lecture, you'll see an example where the spec actually looks quite different from the code. Uh, but uh, that's a fair point. You, you're right that in these examples, and actually quite many examples in this sort of area of formal methods, the simple example you start with almost look like you're just, you know, rearranging, you know, some little things that are, look symbolic and don't seem super relevant. Um, but hopefully by the end of the lecture, we'll see a situation where the spec looks rather different uh, than um, the code itself. Make sense? Yeah. All right, Bill. Uh, so yeah, I had a question. How formal does that uh, post condition need to be? Like I, I saw in like, for example, 6031, we had like abstraction functions and we just said like, you know, say a crossword puzzle, like a class for that, like, after some operation, it would have this kind of, you know, effect, but like- Yeah, uh, so, okay, yeah, so it, 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 like, at some level, it just needs to be a statement. The question is, who is the spec for? If it's just for some other person, uh, like you probably did in 031, then um, yeah, it just needs to be readable by someone else and understandable. Uh, if it's for uh, sort of engineers, like we saw in the Amazon paper, then maybe the spec needs to be precise enough and formal enough for some tool like TLA to make sense of it. Um, in the lab assignments, we're actually gonna make sure, we're gonna prove things about this kind of specification in Cox. So uh, this uh, spec better be precise enough and formal enough for Cox to make sense of it. Um, so uh, lab one is gonna directly sort of get you guys in this mindset and uh, get you some practice of what kind, how do you type this up? And part of the reason we assign software foundations is so that you can get some experience um, with the language Galena uh, that you're going to be using to write these specs in the labs. Okay, got it. Thanks. Sure. Okay, so that's one example of such a spec. Another example might be for the average function that uh, we saw, uh, we see here on the left. 
and there the spec is going to look like this average um, similarly as a precondition that's a function of the state here we actually have a non-trivial precondition because you know we're going to divide by count over here on the left that turns up being zero uh, you know let's just say we don't want to talk about what happens in that situation so we could do that by saying that you're just not allowed to call average according to the spec if the count is zero so we'll say the precondition is the count cannot be zero and the post condition of uh, the state and the return value is that the new state is the same as the old state and the result value is just what the state's total used to be divided by the count in that state which didn't change so that's what a spec for the average function might look like in this for logic style make sense questions about this I'm wondering, are the total count and the variables in this case global, or how should we think about? So the way to think of them is really they're part of the state. So that's the whole logic view of the world. All the variables and everything that she sort of persists across the invocation of a function um, is part of the state. So that's why we keep referring to their values when we talk about the spec, as with respect to one of these state variables. So we talk about s prime dot total here, where my cursor is. Uh, and we can also refer to s dot total, so the, the value of total in the starting state versus the value of total in the final state. Um, so all these variables uh, that are persistent, if you will, like cross function invocations are part of the state. That's the way to think of it. And you might have local variables, and then they don't really matter. You can make them part of the state if you want to reason about them, or you can sort of stick them in just like a local variable that you use while doing the proof, uh, but not uh, part of the state. And we'll see an example of that actually. Uh, Quite shortly. Make sense? Cool. All right. So let's uh, try to figure out how do we actually prove something like this spec from this code? So the question is how do we establish some kind of a relation uh, between the code on the left and the spec on the right? And as you guys already know, right, like this is a little bit of a toy example. It looks pretty much the same. What are we trying to prove here? Um, but it'll be instructive just to figure out how do we precisely make this proof go through. And then um, after, in the second half of the lecture, we'll look at abstractions where this is going to be a little bit less trivial looking. Hopefully. So the general rule for how you prove anything in for logic is using what's called a sequencing rule. And this is basically an approach for how you're going to prove anything about a piece of code. And the answer is you'll break it down into smaller pieces and then reason about them in sequence. Um, so just to make this a little bit more concrete, this is a really important idea that uh, for logic is like the core of for logic at some level. Um, what we want to do is uh, reason about the execution of um, some function here that takes us from state S0 at the bottom all the way to, I don't know, state S1 over here on the right. And this function um, is going to be composed of multiple pieces. So let's say it's calling x followed semicolon followed by calling y. So this is the um, situation where core logic really shines and gives us an answer for how to prove the correctness of something like this function that has two steps in it. The answer is some level is going to look fairly boring or like straightforward, but turns out to be very powerful. Um, so the plan is we want to prove that this big function f that's composed of x and y um, is going to satisfy some spec. So Amanda, quick question here. Yeah, can sorry, can you explain one more time what the f colon equals x? Oh equals? yeah, sorry. So what I mean by this, I'm a little bit sloppy in my syntax, so I apologize for that. What I mean by this is that, um, let me sort of redraw this here. Uh, what I want to say is that um, we want to reason about some function f being invoked here that gets us from state s0 to state s1. And what we're thinking on the side is that actually um, this function f, um, uh, all right, um, what we're thinking about is on the side, this function f is actually um, def, uh, sorry, the, the function f. Um, is composed basically of two things. It first calls x and then sort of semicolon, then it's going to call um, y. So that's what I meant to say. 
Sorry, did you write anything more? Because sorry, did you write anything more than the F parentheses or um or do, I'm just wondering if there's a disconnect with the system or some technical difficulty. But if not, then that's one. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me see. So over here on the right, maybe I don't know if you're seeing this part of the screen that's on the right side where I sort of wrote the def f colon x semicolon y. Yep, that's better. Yeah. Um, so th that's sort of what I wanted to uh, imply by that statement that uh, f colon equals x semicolon y, that we're trying to prove some spec about the function f. And the way we're going to do it is by uh, breaking up the function f into some constituent components, like it does x first, which is the first sort of thing it does is x, then it does y, and uh, we're going to prove the spec for the whole function f by building it up out of the smaller pieces for x and y. Okay. Thank All right. And the spec that we want to prove here uh, is going to be um, in the whole logic style, of course, a precondition and a postcondition. So here we have some kind of a precondition for f that we'd like to prove. Um, so we're going to start with a state that satisfies the precondition for f. And our goal is to prove that the post condition for f is going to hold on the new, on the final state. So the plan, the sequencing rule, is going to require that we already have specs for these smaller building blocks, x and y. And we're going to consider the intermediate state that we get, like let's call it s prime. And this is going to be the state where we get to by running the first half of the function, namely the x thing. And then we'll eventually sort of run the y part and get over to the final state. And what we're going to do is we're going to require for the sequencing rule that we already have some kind of a spec for the x piece of the code. So uh, here's a precondition for x that needs to hold in order for us to use that spec. And it's going to establish that the post condition for x is going to hold. And here I'm glossing over the return values. They, I think most of you work out clearly. If it's not clear, please ask, and I'll try to thread in the return values here. Uh, but the overall picture, I think, mostly makes sense uh, just by thinking of pre and post conditions applying to the states. And just so happens that there's also a return value that you sort of put into the post condition. All right, so we have a spec for X and uh, Erwin. Question, how many intermediate states sh should we consider for a function? How, uh, so just to clarify, you're asking how to, think, how to figure out what is the state that matters. Yeah, for example, you define one as prime and, that's, and you call it an intermediate state. How many usually we're gonna uh, define or yeah, there are sort of two questions, two aspects to this. One is what goes into one of these circles. So what's inside of S prime or what's inside of S zero. And the answer to that is basically the whole system state that you have to worry about. That's a little bit sort of overwhelming, if you will, because it's like everything that could possibly matter in your system has to be in that state. And we're going to read a paper called separation logic in uh, two weeks. It's going to really be a very powerful idea for how to avoid the complexity or the messiness that comes about from having to stuff the entire system state into this circle S0. The other part of what you asked about is like how many of these S primes there are or how what's going on with these intermediate states. And the answer to that is actually there's just one. So the sequencing rule, you can apply it over and over, but the basic building block, the sequencing rule, just breaks up the function f into two parts, the first and the second. So there's always one guy, S prime, in the middle that we have to worry about. And then you could apply the sequencing rule again and again on the left, on the right, and then you'll get a bunch of S primes from each use of the sequencing rule. Perfect. Thank you. Super. Yeah. OK. So um, just to clarify, then uh, what we're going to have is, of course, another spec on the right here for the function y. So it has its own precondition for y that relates to the state and a post condition for y over here. So now the question is, what is the sequencing rule? So if you have these pieces for x, the spec for x, and the spec for y, how do you use them to prove that the spec for the entire function f holds? So drawn out this way, hopefully it wouldn't be too surprising. So the, the plan is, what you have to show is that the precondition of the function f that, you have, that you're trying to prove at the total level, if you will, the total precondition of your function here, has to imply 
the precondition of the first piece. So this pink arrow is logical implication between predicates. So the way to think of it is that if the precondition of function f holds, then you have to prove that that's enough to also satisfy the precondition of x, the first piece. And if that's the case, that's great. We can actually use the spec for the first piece, x. And we can use that to establish the post condition holds in this intermediate state. Then we're not going to reason about the S prime itself. We're going to reason it in terms of these predicates. So what we have to prove is that the predicate, the post X predicate implies the precondition of the next piece we're going to run, the precondition of Y. The way to think of it is that after we run X, we got our state into such a situation where the post condition of X holds. And by the way, that's enough to actually satisfy the precondition of Y. So once that's the case, we can logically use the spec for Y and we establish that the post condition of Y is true. And the last sort of logical jump we have to make is prove that the post condition of Y implies the post condition of our overall function. So, so when, yeah, go ahead. When you say proved, does that mean like Proved by induction, proved by uh, So the cool thing here is that there's no necessarily induction going on uh, or not, not fundamentally re required there be induction here because these are just statements about um, a predicate here on the left and the predicate on the right of this implication arrow. Um, it might be that if the predicates have some complicated statement that requires induction to prove, maybe you'll have to use induction here. But roughly, these are basically like three cock proofs, one here, one here, and one here. So if you prove these three pink arrows in cock, like we'll have you guys do in the labs, then you'll be able to put together the existing proofs that X satisfies the spec and the existing proof that Y satisfies its spec and get a proof that all of F satisfies its bigger spec with pre-F and post-F. Okay. Cool. So fairly simple idea at some level, but uh, often the devil is in the details. And this uh, idea turns out to be sort of both tricky in surprising ways and actually very powerful. So we'll uh, sort of look at that. Um, so one thing I wanted to uh, go through is an example of um, how to apply the sequencing rule. Um, so what we're going to do is actually look at um, a sort of decomposition of the add function here. So this is going to be an example of you know, applying the for logic sequencing rule to this add function. Um, so here is the code that we already saw before. And at the bottom is uh, what you can sort of think of as a breakdown of the code into really primitive operations. We don't want to require a spec for necessarily big things like even adding x to the total and writing it back. That's kind of a complicated line, if you will. Uh, so we're just going to require, um, we're going to decompose this function into these uh, sort of four statements. Read the total and then write it back with x added, and then read the count and write it back with plus 1 being the value. Uh, so this also gives an example of one of these temporary variables, TMP here, that aren't going to be part of the state. They're just going to be part of the execution of one function. Once the function is done, it actually doesn't matter what temp was. So it's not going to be part of our state. Uh, the state is just going to contain total and count here. So in order to apply this sequencing rule here, we have to cook up with uh, sort of primitive specs for these baseline operations, reads and writes. Um, so what do these guys look like? Um, so here's the specs uh, for these primitives. And uh, I'm going to simplify this a little bit and just focus on the post condition because um, only the post condition is really going to matter here. The precondition is going to be true, meaning that you can always invoke a read or a write. So here's uh, you know, the operation read total. So if you want to read the total, uh, then the post condition, uh, which is going to bad my mouse cursor keeps disappearing. Uh, the post condition is going to be, again, a function of the new state and the return value is going to say that the new state S prime is exactly the same as the old state. And by the way, the return value R is the total field. So that's the fairly straightforward spec for reading the total. Reading the count is going to look 
basically the same. It's going to say the post condition for reading the count is uh, also doesn't change the state, but the return value you get back is the count field. And the spec for writing is going to be similar. So if we write to the total field some value d, then what we'll have is that the new state in the total field has changed to be the old total field uh, plus the the value uh sorry not not plus so this is uh, just a straight up right so the new total field is the value b and uh apologies for the technical difficulties here so the new total field is the value b and the new count field is the same thing that was there before and if you write to the count field um this is not going to be surprising at all the new count field is v and the new total field stays the same. So one benefit of really spelling this out is that um, it's going to help us mechanize and understand how to piece together these bigger proofs. So now that we have these uh, building blocks on the right, we're going to apply them on the left, very much like the whole logic sequencing rule would tell us. Um, so before anything starts, uh, the precondition for the whole function is just true, so that holds. After we run the read operation, we look up the spec for read over here, and it tells us that, uh, I guess I should say that basically like there's some kind of a state, maybe S0 over here. After we run the read, then we're going to use this spec over here, and it says that S1 is equal to S0 and temp is equal to s0 dot total. You can sort of think of this as really just plugging in these little specs from the right and substituting the symbol. So the s prime is s1 and s is s0. So then we do the right. So we're going to use this spec over here. So what we're going to say is that s2 dot total is equal to the thing that we're writing it, which is temp plus x. Temp is s0 dot total from up here, plus x. And from this spec over here, s2 dot count is going to carry over. So s2 like that. Um, s2 dot count is equal to s1 dot count. All right, and then we do a read of count here. So again, S3 is equal to S2 because the read doesn't change the state. And the return value temp is equal to the S2 dot count value. And finally, here, S4 dot count is being written to. That's going to be uh, the value of temp plus one. So S2 dot count plus one. That's what we're writing in. And the value of total is preserved according to the spec for W. And that's just S3 dot count. All right, so now we have this extremely pedantic representation of what happens in this add function. Uh, but the cool thing is actually if we thread through all the assignments here, so we plug in S0 for S1 and so on, then after some very mechanical simplifications, we actually get a statement that basically S4 dot uh, count is equal to s0 dot count plus one and s4 dot total is uh I'm sure then total uh, is equal to s0 dot total plus the x value that we passed in so this sort of just threads through uh, uh, all the values uh, that are up to, uh, going through the system state in this very simple example. This is the kind of reasoning that you're going to, you guys are going to be doing in labs, hopefully in a more interesting way. That makes sense. Questions about this slightly mechanical, perhaps example. <laughs> 
And do you have to prove those subparts, like the R total post and pre? Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, so on this set of assumptions that we have on the right side, so uh, these guys, these are, for the purpose of this proof, these are just assumptions. We assume that they are going to be true. Now, they might come as just axioms of your system. So for example, your processor at some level is going to promise to you that certain opcodes do certain things. And you might want to take that as an axiom that you'll just believe. It might be an axiom in your language, like we'll assume that this is how Python works or how C works or how, I don't know, x86 processes work on Linux. Um, or you might prove them. So we're going to look at layering sort of in a second, uh, but uh, that's uh, depending on the use case and exactly what these operations are, you might either just assume them to be correct, well, by, by writing them down explicitly as an axiom, um, or you might prove that this is actually a true statement about how R and W run based on some lower level assumptions. Pretty much all the proofs that uh, you can ever do in formal methods require some set of assumptions about how the underlying world runs. Like at some extreme philosophical end, you have to assume something like QFT for like how the world works at the physics level uh, and then build up from there. Um, and probably that's the extreme end, no one's gonna do that, but uh, you probably are gonna assume how transistors work or how your hardware instruction set works um, as primitives about uh, how your system behaves and then build up the behavior of the larger system from those building blocks. Make sense? Half an hour ago, you told us that we didn't have to worry about all those little green circles. But you just spent the last 15 minutes telling us about all those green circles. Uh, can you say that again? Uh, I, what, what was the detail I told you not to worry about and then described well, anyway? We had a picture showing that we could get from the pre-state to the post precondition to the post condition, and we didn't have to worry about all the little intermediate states. That's so right. So those little green circles. That's right, yeah. So uh, and now you've just shown us a whole bunch of little green circles. Exactly, yeah. So I think the difference, what's going on, is that in the uh, for logic specification that we were, that I was sort of espousing up here, uh, the green circles don't matter to the total spec. So the total spec for the function f just worries about the precondition and the postcondition. And the, the reason we have to think about the green circles is really a proof artifact. That's how we're going to construct the proof uh, by understanding how the code runs. But once we've proven that we've arrived at this post condition state S1, that satisfies the post condition, we can forget about how we got there. We can forget about the path of the green circles and just remember the final state. So that's perhaps what I meant more precisely. All right, uh, any other questions? So which, right. part, yeah, go ahead. which part of this does cock do? So the best way to think of cock is that cock is going to check that all the symbol pushing was done correctly. Cock, you know, in the most decimal view of the world, cock doesn't do much for you other than check your work. Uh, We'll see that it's maybe a little bit more powerful than that, um, but Hawk is not really about finding proofs. Hawk is really all about checking proofs. Um, so the value of Hawk is that it will force us in the lab assignments to be very precise in writing down all these expressions and specs that I've been sketching out just informally on this whiteboard. And it's going to syntax check them. And it's going to make sure that uh, this kind of an argument that's sketched out here on the bottom of the slide actually holds water and is actually correct. So in Coq, we're going to encode these rules of whole logic. And as a result, Coq is going to help us check that we're following these rules precisely. And therefore, if we get Coq to say, OK, then we will have some confidence that we really did construct a correct proof. We didn't accidentally, you know, make a typo like I did right here. Cock will catch that. Okay. And so more cool. interesting examples of mistakes too. This is a particularly boring example, but yeah. Right. So cock does the left side and we give cock the right side. Sort of, yeah. So we're going to encode the right side in cock as an assumption of here's how the world is going to work. 
and Koch will help us make sure that we've uh, proven something sensible from these low-level assumptions like uh, what we see on the left side of the board. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Thanks very much for all the questions, by the way. This is great. Uh, much more interesting for hopefully all of us. All right. So um, let's now talk a little bit about um, abstraction relations and how they fit into the picture. Um, so uh, abstractions. So one way to understand where abstractions come in is that our goal in formal verification is to have a simple specification. Uh, and simple, not in necessarily in terms of how many symbols or how many lines, but how well it captures our intent or what we expect from the system. Because at the end of the day, if we're going to apply some kind of a proof like this uh, to a system or construct a proof, it's only as good as the spec that we are proving is achieved. So Butler made this point uh, last week as well. Uh, so just an example, we want to talk about the spec for StatDB. Uh, so the example spec that I've been giving so far looks kind of boring in the sense that it just describes literally what the code does in just a slightly different syntax for managing variables and states. A different way you might think about the spec for StatDB is really in terms of a set or a history of values that you've seen. So uh, here's a different spec that I'll propose that StatDB might aim for or try to uh, satisfy. So I might say that the function add should really take the value x and uh, you know, append x to the history of all values. So logically, instead of thinking of StatDB, this pair of functions add an average, of providing an interface that just like has two variables that count the total and the count, Instead, maybe we should think of or propose to think of these functions as maintaining a logical history. So add, just add y to this history of stuff you've seen. And the average function is going to return the average value in history of the history. So a slightly different formulation of the correctness uh, spec for the StatDB example. And uh, you might argue which one is more natural, but uh, in some situations, a spec like this uh, is perhaps more helpful. And uh, for some users, this might actually be a more natural representation of what they expect StatDB to implement. Does this make sense? Any questions about this? All right. so. In order to realize this plan, now we have to have a little bit more sophisticated machinery because what's going on is that the spec, you know, we'll make it formal in a second, uh, but the spec is actually talking about some something called a history, which is not really a part of our state so far. It's not the total variable and it's not the count variable. So the general plan for doing this thing called state abstraction, uh, at least with uh, respect to this sort of whole logic view of the world that we're espousing here, uh, it's going to be threefold. And uh, the reason I say with respect to whole logic is that Butler is next week going to talk about sort of the general view of this, how to think of state abstraction in the general case. Uh, but here I'll give you a more perhaps concrete example that will make sense in the context of the lab assignments um, and give you some intuition for how to think of the general case when it shows up. Uh, so the general plan is, uh, in order to do this kind of state abstraction, to sort of introduce a notion of a history that's not the real code level state, uh, we're going to actually have to you know, define what is this new type of state. And we'll talk about this as a spec state here, uh, as opposed to code level state. And uh, then we have to actually write our spec as if the world executes uh, with this kind of a state instead of the code level representation of the state. So in this case, we'll, uh, we'll write out a spec uh, using this uh, notion of a history shortly. 
And the final thing that has to happen is that we can't just imagine this, you know, logical history floating out there in space. What the hell does it mean? <laughs> so we have to connect this to reality, and we do this um, by the use of what we call an abstraction relation or an abstraction function in some cases. Um, and um, this is going to enable us to actually prove something about the code which operates on reality in terms of real variables and how that has anything to do with our imagined way of thinking about the world in terms of this history state or the suspect state in general. We have to connect the code state and uh, the spec state together and describe what they have to do with one another. All right, so let's start out by sort of doing these first two steps to make it clear what I'm talking about with this notion of an abstraction uh, for the state. Um, so uh, here's an example for our sort of statdb uh, running thing. Um, we're going to provide, uh, apologize for my mouse resetting. So here's an example uh, for how we might write down a spec for um, you know, our functions from statdb. But first, we're going to have to define the state. So logically, our new spec state is going to be a list of natural numbers, or nats in uh, clock terminology. Um, and uh, once we have this state, we can talk about uh, the pre and post conditions for these functions. Um, as before, the precondition for add is still going to be uh, just true, uh, no requirements for calling add. But the post condition is kind of interesting now. So the post condition of add takes the new state as prime. And it says that uh, in the new state s prime, the state itself is just uh, this history list of nats. So it just says that the new state is equal to the old state concatenated with the one element x. So this is a cock syntax for appending x to the list s. This is a very different now specification for what add is doing compared to what we were writing down before. And similarly, we can write down a spec for the average function using uh, this uh, uh, logical or sort of spec state here. And the spec here is going to say uh, average as a precondition, um, the precondition says that uh, the list cannot be empty. Otherwise, we're going to, uh, there is no average. The precondition says the length of s is not zero. And the post condition is going to say, you know, the return value is going to say the return value is uh, going to be the sum of the list so far divided by the length of the list so far. That's a very different kind of a spec, hopefully, you can see, than the spec we were writing down before. And this is perhaps now more interesting to uh, prove. Uh, make sense? Questions? So with the, the precondition for average right there, like implicitly it, it makes sense because like you can never you can never have negative elements in your list, but Shouldn't it technically be len of s is greater than zero? Um, sure, yeah. So uh, yeah, that seems like a fine uh, change. So maybe we should indeed say that uh, instead the precondition really should say the length of s is uh, greater than zero. Yeah, sure. Or when, if we were to do not equal to zero, would it be implied that it Yeah, so in cock, if these things were nats, then cock nats, as you've probably seen in the assignments, uh, are zero or greater, so there's no way to have a negative nat. So if len is a thing that returns a nat type length of s, then there's no way for it to even return a negative. The type must be uh, zero or greater. Okay. So the two statements about a nat based len are just equivalent. Okay. So in the post condition for average in the previous example, we had that s prime had to be s. Why did, why? Oh, yeah, did I'm you... sorry, I, I've gotten a slightly sloppy here. So precondition takes a function of S, of course, this guy also takes an S prime and indeed, and okay. S prime is equal to S. Thanks for catching that. I, indeed, I just got sloppy here. Absolutely. 
Other questions, clarifications? All right. So let's uh, now talk about the more, the more interesting part of this uh, sort of uh, state abstraction story, which is how we're going to connect the code and the spec states together. So this is what's called an abstraction relation. Let me uh, cook up a new page here. So here's this notion of an abstraction relation. So in the general case, what this relation is going to be is just some sort of function R that takes a code state, uh, we'll call it you know, S here, and a spec state, which is the logical abstract state we've been talking so far. And here we'll call it H, because in our example, it's the history, the high level state history um, in stat DB. So what does this relation look like? So how do we connect the real state in terms of the total and count variables and the high level view of the world as just a history of stuff that happened? Well, we can talk about R of S and H being defined as, uh, um, it's gonna be sort of a logical statement about what's gonna be true about the code state and the history. Well, it's probably not gonna be too surprising um, to you, but uh, worth writing down precisely anyway. Um, what we're going to say is that the total value in the code level state, I keep having to reset my mouse, uh, which is unfortunate, but the, the total value in the um, actual code state must be equal to the sum of the history so far and the count in the actual code state is the length of the history so far. That's what an abstraction relation looks like. Um, and I think it's a probably a correct abstraction relation for our StatDB example here, unless I made some mistake. Um, and it's interesting to talk about what are the different possibilities of how this abstraction relation connects uh, different uh, code and uh, spec level states. Um, so here's an example scenario that I'll propose to you guys. Um, could we ever be in a situation where we have some code level state S over here, and there might be multiple spec level states H and H prime that are connected to it. So this line over here is this R relation. So could we ever have a situation like what I've drawn here, where we have a single code level state, but multiple spec level states H that are related to it? Any thoughts? Yes, right? Can't you have like one, two as your list or two, one? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So in, just in our example of SteadyB here, yep. It uh, basically means that there's many ways in the spec level you could have gotten somewhere, but in reality, you're actually gotten to the same place. So you're exactly right. If you called add one, add two, it's the same as if you called add two, add one. In reality, I mean, at the variable level, but as far as our spec is concerned, logically, there's like two histories that you've gotten. So well, this is totally a legitimate thing. So indeed, this abstraction relation doesn't need to be sort of one-to-one. -one. Um, could we have a situation where there's a real code state that uh, basically doesn't map to anything at all? There's basically no high-level state that it connects to. Is that possible? Pick on some some of you guys. Uh, uh, Kevin, Ben. I'm not really sure. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. It's like a good question. Yeah, sorry. I, I don't necessarily mean that you have to have the answer, but uh, you know, just to get you guys thinking. Um, so, in this example, I think it should be possible uh, to have such a situation. Um, for example, suppose that your count is zero, meaning that you've seen no ads so far. But your total is non-zero. It's kind of a weird, well, it's certainly a possible S state here where like your total is five, but the count is zero. How the hell could this happen? There's no viable history that gets you that because if the count is zero, it means the length is zero. But if the length is zero, the sum's gotta be zero too. So 
it basically means there are some states that at the variable level could exist, but they're just not sensibly reachable in the piece of code we're talking about here, or we're thinking about here. Um, but doesn't that mean that the precondition in this case was not fulfilled or? Um, so there's no precondition here, yeah, right, like, right. so, okay, so, so you're right that uh, uh, very shortly, we're gonna show that indeed, this is sort of precluded by the fact that you have to satisfy this abstraction relation in your precondition. And mm -hmm. indeed, if we're talking about this weird state where the count is zero, but the total is five, just like not a legal state. So we're not gonna have specs that can say anything meaningful mm -hmm. about that state. But what's going to happen is that we're going to prove that reachable states that we want to talk about are never that weird. But basically, all legitimate mm -hmm. states that you can ever reach are actually well formed and don't look like this problem in the okay. left corner. So it's possible for the state to sort of logically to like exist, but we'll never get to the state. That's sort of the, the plan. And similarly, you can imagine there's also situations that look differently where there might be multiple code level states that correspond to the same history. Uh, this is in principle possible, uh, but not, not actually possible in our StatDB example. Uh, but in other cases, this is possible. So if you imagine that part of the actual low level state S is some kind of a cache, then the cache probably is not relevant with respect to the high level state H, but nonetheless, the low level state might actually be different. And similarly, there's, yeah, so that's hopefully builds up some intuition for you guys for how to think about um, this abstraction relation. So what I wanna sort of draw now is um, sort of another diagram of these state transitions that's gonna capture how we wanna think about correctness when there's this abstraction relation uh, in play for us. Um, so here's a, of the same view of the world. At the bottom level, we'll still have states and one state transitioning into another state as prime through by running some function f. And now we want to talk about what does it mean for this uh, function to have a spec written in terms of higher level states, not this s, but some h. And what we, the way we want to think about this is that there's an h up here, and it relates to the starting state through our abstraction relation r. And these sort of lines are what's given to us. So when we want to start reasoning about running f in state s, then sort of a precondition of that is that there better be a well-formed state h that corresponds to our starting state. So I'm going to rule out the weird state that we saw at the bottom left of this slide, where it's just a nonsensical state to begin with. And then what it means for this function f to execute correctly in the sort of abstract view of the world is that there has to be another state. Um, um, let me call this guy um, H prime over here, which has to be um, related with the abstraction relation to S prime. So this green stuff is what we have to show sort of as part of our proof for the function F that there exists the state H prime where we get to that corresponds to S prime. And this transition should be allowed by our spec for the function F. So what it means for this transition to be allowed, the sort of horizontal green line, is that the pre-imposed condition for function F when written in terms of a history actually say that's an okay sort of pair, precondition, postcondition for this function. That makes some sense, hopefully. So let me write down the same diagram in terms of the for logic syntax that we've been using so far. So if you want to capture the same thing, let's imagine this function f is something like add x, then what it means to capture this diagram in for logic is that for add of x, uh, we have a precondition. And the precondition is going to be in terms of the low level state S, but we're going to say the precondition is there has to exist some high level state H such that the relation holds between these guys, so S and H. So this captures the point that we were talking about over here, where we're going to prohibit starting with a bizarre state that corresponds to no history because this has to be in the precondition. That's how we're going to require it. 
And then the post condition is going to be a function of S prime and the return value. And it's going to say that, well, we're going to promise in the post condition that there does exist a state H prime that is related to the concrete code state S prime where we ended up. And by the way, here's the post condition that we actually wanted to write down, which is H prime is equal to H concatenated with this new element X. So that's how these abstraction relations fit into core logic, which is that this notion of there being a high level state that's related to the code state shows up in both the precondition and the post condition. This is probably the most important use of preconditions in core logic as far as we are going to see them is to restrict the execution, the, the executions of this function that we have to worry about to executions in a well formed starting state. And uh, this well formed starting state is going to satisfy some kind of an invariant. In our case, it's this invariant that it actually corresponds to some nice logical high level view H and not only are we going to require it on entry to our function, we're going to also promise that it's still there on exit. It's still well formed. And by having the same well formedness invariant, if you will, in both the precondition and the post condition, we're going to be able to now chain these together. Very much like in the whole logic sequencing rule, we saw having to prove that the post condition of the first thing implies the precondition of the second thing. Hopefully you can see that in this formulation, they sort of naturally follow from one another uh, because the same well-formedness shows up on both sides. So Christodel, you want to ask something? Yes, just to be clear, what exactly does R represent in this case? Is it uh, some form of abstraction for a function? R is exactly this thing that we were writing on the left. So R is this abstraction relation that defines what it means for some code level state S and some high level sort of spec level state H to be connected to one another. Um, okay. So this okay. is part of what it entails to do a proof with uh, abstract states. Um, so we can't just, uh, okay, so we, we can't just sort of invent a high level state and then go try to prove this without ever explaining how our imaginary view of the world at the top level has anything to do with the reality in terms of variables at the bottom level. And uh, this abstraction relation is this sort of connection that you have to formally spell out. And that's going to allow us to do formal proofs about okay. code using this abstraction relation. Make sense? Other questions about this? All right, so um, the last thing I want to sort of end on here is uh, an explanation of sort of two interesting things in uh, sort of this uh, abstraction relations and uh, how they line up with core logic. Um, so one really cool thing about these abstraction relations is that they layer very well. So um, as I think we briefly touched on already, um, layering turns out to be really important because you don't want to decompose all of your code into those low level reads and writes perhaps. Um, and the cool thing about uh, viewing the world in these abstraction relations and the core logic is that you can start out with a description of your system in terms of some really low level primitive operations bottom level that perhaps transitions from you know, state S0, S1, et cetera, you know, S5 over here. And it's important at some level, if, or if you want to convince ourselves that we're performing these green steps correctly, we have to reason at that level. But the powerful thing here is that we can actually prove at one point that uh, maybe these guys correspond to this blue representation that if we start with a state S0 that corresponds to a high level abstract state H0, and we prove that after these uh, five steps in this example, we end up in some kind of a high level state H5, then we can forget about all this green stuff. And we can think of basically our piece of code going directly from state H0 to H5. And the cool thing is that not only can we gloss over the details of these internal green states over here, we can also forget about the state that was used to describe the, the, how the green states used to be described like in terms of registers or low level variables. Here in the standard DB example, this H is written purely in terms of this history. We can totally forget that the world is actually about variables. 
And that's really nice because it lets you bring up the level of abstraction, think in terms of bigger things and simplify your proofs or write more concise specs. That's a really powerful idea. And the cool thing is you can, of course, keep going and uh, sort of go up the stack some more with this. Um, so you could uh, define yet another level. Uh, maybe I'll call it Z variables, uh, for lack of a better variable name. So here we might have Z0. You could prove an abstraction relation between our history, H, and this new hypothetical thing called Z. And as long as we define some abstraction relation, and we can uh, talk about um, how this guy evolves all the way to, I don't know, Z9. And all we need to do is basically show that eventually the H gets to some state H9, and we prove this abstraction relation over here. Hopefully it makes um, some sense. Uh, maybe it's a little bit abstract, but uh, you'll see examples of this in the lab assignment to some extent. Sense? So one other thing you guys are going to see in the lab assignments is actually the way we model everything is uh, sort of that we assume that there's something called a world at the bottom level of the stack. So the, the lowest level unit at which the machine executes is these world states, W0, W1, etc. And these guys are actually opaque. We don't actually tell you what they are. We don't really implement them directly, but that's just the model of how we think of the computer as running. And uh, what it means for us to uh, provide some axioms about some low level API, like handling variables, is that we assume that there's some connection between our states like S0 and S1 and these worlds. And we sort of posit that, well, you know, must exist somehow, but we don't specify exactly what it is. And then we just say, eventually, after some number of world steps, you get into a green state S1. And that uh, you know, has some post condition that you can rely on. So we'll sort of see how we axiomatize that in a second. We'll look at the talk source code of it. Make sense? Questions about this stuff? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I can't actually tell which participants have raised the hand, but uh, try to demux in some order. Anyone? Quick. I mean, this is more like a philosophical question, but it's, this is very interesting to me. Um, it seems to me that uh, many specs are going to be equivalent. Um, and if, if for certain programs, we're going to generate very similar specs. Not maybe exactly the same, but the, in, in essence, they are going to be equivalent. So if that's the case, do we have a reference of specs that we can, like, like a bank of knowledge that we can use as a guide when we work on this? Or, or I think just... this is a very good point, that indeed there's many, many ways to write the same thing. And it's even worse than in programming. What I mean by this is that, you know, when you're writing a piece of code, there's only so many ways to implement the same function. At least in coding, there's two good things going for us. One is that there's efficiency, which drives some choice. Like there's a more efficient implementation and a less efficient implementation. And another sort of thing going on in coding is that we have a ton of experience. We've done a whole lot of implementations and we know this is a messy piece of code. This is a clean piece of code, etc. There's less of both of these informal methods, less experience because we haven't done as many examples of proving stuff and specifying stuff as we have in implementing them. And there just isn't a performance consideration for these specs. But that's not to say that all these specs are equally good. As you'll see in the labs, small details in specs have actually a tremendous impact on how difficult it is to make the proof go through or to state the abstraction relation. So this stuff matters a lot, but we don't really understand what is a precise formulation of what is a good spec or a bad spec. There's just many examples you have to work out and build up some intuition for what will be convenient for proving or specifying and what will be messy. I think that's actually a big value of the lab assignments is you'll have to write specs for certain things and work with them and you'll hopefully get some appreciation of what, what will go wrong or what will be the difference if you write it one of these 20 different ways. Absolutely a good point, uh, but it's kind of hard to offer precise guidance on what is a good spec. It's just, you have to look at them. The papers will get you exposure to sort of sophisticated specs that are hard to pull off in the course of a single lab assignment. And, uh, we'll talk about them as like what, 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 what was good, what was bad. 
And in lab assignments, you'll get very hands-on, but much simpler specs. And then someone else raised their Thanks. hand as Thanks, well. Bro. Question? Anyone else? That was left over from before. All right. Okay, so um, maybe the last thing I wanted to uh, say is that, okay, so one really cool property about these abstraction relations that um, sort of hard to explain for me in one minute, but one really surprising thing is that this abstraction relation turns out not to matter for correctness, which is really surprising in some ways. Uh, but the cool thing is that uh, you don't have to trust that the abstraction relation was correct, and you don't have to know exactly how the abstraction relation was defined. So as long as the proof goes through with some abstraction relation, then you know that the system or the code you're talking about will behave in that way described at the top level spec, like the Z's that we see over here at the top of this diagram. So if you have a spec for some function in terms of these Z's states that are super high level, you don't really have to look at what the hell this relation R is between the Z's and the H's and the S's and the W's. It could be anything. As long as the proof for the correctness at the Z level went through, you don't actually need to worry about what that abstraction relation is. That's a really cool thing. And it's like worth to ponder maybe in the back of your head why that's true or how that works out. Um, but uh, maybe the last thing I will spend sort of one minute on literally is to show you how the ideas I was showing in today's lecture connect to the COC code that we asked you guys to read. Uh, so here's a module that uh, you're gonna use for lab one. This is an implementation or definition of the variables layer. So this is a, a layer that has three variables, X, Y, and Z, slightly more general than the count and total that we looked at in our example so far. Um, and we're gonna define Here's what a state looks like that consists of three variables, X, Y, and Z. And then we're gonna axiomatize or assume away that we have functions called read and write that let us read and write these X variables, very much like the R and W primitives that I was showing you guys. So here's the read spec. It is written in this whole logic style. So the precondition is true. Hopefully it looks familiar. And the post condition here is basically just what I was talking about. The state prime is equal to state. And also the return value just fishes out the variable that you asked for. So that's what the state bar helper is doing. And there's a similar thing for writing. So here's a write spec. It says that the post condition is you return nothing. And depending on which variable you are trying to write, we're gonna update that variable. These are exactly the low level primitives that we asked that we sort of covered in this lecture. And then we ask you in the lab to implement uh, the statdb interface where the state is literally a list of nats and we're going to ask you to implement these specs for adding and asking for the mean the average so the add spec says that you just add v to the list which is the state and the spec for average basically says the you know if the state was empty you actually get an error back and if the state was not empty you're going to get back the sum of the values divided by the length of the values so hopefully this now makes a little bit more sense having seen the lecture. And then the proc and abstraction file that you guys read for today's lecture capture the infrastructure that I was trying to describe. So here, for example, in the proc file, we define this view of the system as executing through a sequence of world states. So this is what this world type is. And uh, then we're gonna describe um, what here sort of what all the code looks like. It's, either a connective between two pieces of smaller code or some base operation in some uh, in that world. Um, so we just step through a bunch of low level world steps that are sort of abstracted away from us. And uh, what we see over here is the machinery. Um, I'm not going to read through this for reasoning about a bunch of these steps and uh, some logic for reasoning about crashes and recovery that will be important for later labs. And then in the subtraction file, the main thing to look at and take away is that we can define the subtraction relation. So here's the same picture I was drawing in lecture. And uh, we can also look at the definition of an abstraction here, which is literally the same thing I was describing with that R relation, which is it takes one state and another state and gives us a prop, like a proposition describing when is this actually relation true of this pair of states.
So hopefully this lecture will be a good counterpart for you guys for understanding this infrastructure that we've set up for you for the lab assignment, and also maybe a concrete way to uh, start wrapping your head more about uh, what it means to have a formal spec and uh, proof and uh, abstraction relation. All right, so I, that's, that's it for the time we've had for this lecture. So feel free to uh, disappear off to the next lecture where you guys need to run. But if there's any questions left over, uh, I'm more than happy to answer them now as well. Uh, one thing that I didn't totally understand uh, is what you said right at the very end about uh, not needing to trust the abstraction relation. Um, I guess I didn't, so the way I, I, I've been interpreting what you were saying was that the abstraction relation tells you how your uh, implementation state is related to the spec state. Uh, and if your spec is about the spec state, then if I have a bad abstraction relation, then anything I prove about the spec, uh, I guess the, the, the higher level version wouldn't tell me anything about the implementation. So I, I think maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. I didn't really see how, <clears throat> how the abstraction relation is untrusted. So what I mean by this is that if you want to have confidence that, okay, so the, the worldview, just to recall from Horlogic's point of view, is that you're just going to call functions and you're going to get some results back from those functions. That's the only thing that's going on. And as long as those functions satisfy a, a Horlogic spec, that you know, has some starting state and a satisfying a precondition and a final state satisfying a post condition with those guys written in terms of this high level state, then as long as that's actually true, then you don't care what abstraction relation was used to prove that the function is correct with respect to that whole logic spec. So uh, uh, there's no mistake that the prover could have made in defining the abstraction relation that would both still make the proof go through but screw you up if you're relying on the post condition holding true. I see. Okay. So, so you're actually the actual the, the sort of final theorem that you're proving isn't, uh, I guess, doesn't depend on the abstraction relation. That's right, and it doesn't depend on so two no, actually, One okay. is that its correctness doesn't depend on the abstraction relation. Uh, you know, the, the, there's a, yeah, you don't have to trust the abstraction relation was correct in order to believe the theorem statement. And the second is that it's actually irrelevant to the user, which is maybe even a more powerful statement. The user right. doesn't have to worry about how the abstraction relation was set up. They can just use the API and use the whole logic specs and any abstraction relation will be equally as good as far as the caller is concerned. Modular performance. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, comments? There's a whole bunch, I guess, of Zoom comments that I can't see because the Zoom Linux client is a little bit substandard, but perhaps the TAs have handled those somehow. All right, well, if there's no other questions, uh, thanks very much. See you guys on Thursday. We're going to look at the Everest paper, and Butler is going to tell you uh, his view on that. Thanks.